On today's show, we conclude our series on Andre Chikatilo. We'll take a look at his gruesome final murders and the ongoing pressure on investigators to catch this killer. We'll discuss the new tactics investigators used to catch Chikatilo, the police interrogations, his confessions, and the courtroom drama that closes out this grisly story. I'm Mike. I'm Ian. And I'm Dave. If you thought part one was tough to get through, stick around. Part two of the story is even harder. Everything except Andre's penis, that is. That is definitely not any harder. This is Necronomapod. Expert psychiatrists, doctors, and scientists in psychiatry would be able to confirm this. Many of them, even on the basis of what they observe, if they were interested. They could hardly doubt that this is a person who is not in any way responsible for his actions. In order to certify someone as mentally sick, you must clearly determine the presence of some kind of psychiatric disorder, which is sufficiently pronounced and sufficiently serious to deprive them of the ability to make a choice in a given situation. Despite all his psychological abnormalities, this was not the case with Chikatilo. Chikatilo retained this ability right up to the last. Do you guys dip your pizza rolls? No. Like the, the microwave? Yeah, thing? like the Totinos or, you know, whatever you use. No. Okay. You? I never did. Huh. And then I was chatting with some listeners in our Discord, and they all were making it sound like I was crazy because I didn't dip my uh, pizza rolls. What do you dip it in? Ranch? They dip it in ranch. Some dip it in marinara. Huh. Some dip it in my hot sauce. So, I've hmm. tried it. And? Pretty fucking good, actually. Really? Yeah. I actually, the ranch was good, but then I tried hot sauce recently. Amazing. Sounds good. Really good. I never thought, like, I didn't know people dipped their pizza rolls. What kind of hot sauce? Uh, I had, like, a Frank's, like, red hot sauce. Okay. Just a generic one. Okay. Um, I don't know. It was tasty. It worked. So, I don't I know. Try, I would try that. Yeah. It was just a weird thing. That, like, I felt like, oh, I didn't know people did this. I thought I was a connoisseur of, like, all things junk food. People dip their pizza rolls, apparently. Interesting. Was this like people in Kentucky or what, what, what region? <laughs> I don't I don't remember yeah. specifically who, oh, right. what, where, what, who was like, you know, who was ostracizing me, Ostr- ostracizing, who was ostracizing me. We've recorded a show well, before. I this. mean, upscale people don't eat pizza rolls, so it had to be in the kind of the. If, if being upscale means you don't eat pizza rolls, I never want to be upscale. <laughs> this podcast can make millions. I'm still going to be sitting on my fucking couch eating pizza rolls at two in the morning, watching The Office on Netflix. <laughs> I'm just saying I, I, I thought I thought it was stupid and then I tried it pretty fucking good. I highly recommend you guys dip your pizza rolls. Sounds good. I think like some yum yum sauce might be good. Now that I think about it. That would be all right. Hmm. I have to try this. Yeah. Let's get a bag of pizza rolls next episode. We'll be snacking on pizza rolls right. while, we're, while we're talking. Uh, also, so I don't know if it was documented on a bonus episode or a uh, a Sunday normal episode, but a few months back, I made a comment about how I had sliced my index finger, which I use to text because I'm a weird texter. I use my right thumb and my left hand index finger. I don't sure. use my left thumb. Sure. But it ruined my life. That I couldn't text properly. All right. Dave, something happened to you recently. <laughs> After you, I was mocked for saying I didn't even want to get out of bed in the morning you, because of how tough it is. You were roundly dismissed and mocked with that story. I would agree. <laughs> but this past weekend, I was going to grab my recycling bin, take it up to the recycling dump. Low key brag. He flex or low key bla- <laughs> brag. Low key flex. He recycles. I do my part. Cares to, about the environment. I do my part to save the world. Okay. <laughs> And I just went to grab it on the side and my thumb like went on the inside into a Miller Lite can and it pretty deeply <laughs> sliced my thumb <laughs> and it took a while to stop bleeding. And then I wrapped it up and was unable to properly text for the next couple of days. And I I'm going to rescind my mockery of your of your story because it was pretty difficult. It's terrible. I had to move to my right index finger and it was not fun. <laughs> <laughs> Very hard to communicate with people. Throws off your entire day. I was uh, I was not happy with uh, myself. <laughs> no. What's funny is it was probably like one, one of my Miller Lite cans that's thrown in your recycle bin. I, I'm sure it was. It was not you know, like you know shoved in or in the side really tight and boom. I thought went right in the can. Ian, you're next. That means 
You can get a yeah. little slice on the thumb and then you're going to have to like readapt the way you, te- you text. I should have went to the audio uh, dictation mode that day. There you <laughs> go. That would have been better. <laughs> Next yeah. time. Well, luckily, I think all of our fingers have healed. So no need to. Uh, good. That's pretty deep. It's, yeah. Uh, yeah, it's looking good now. Wow. So speaking of body mutilations, <laughs> going back to our favorite, <laughs> what, Italian serial killer, right? Andre Chicatillo. <laughs> He make up the best chicken parmesan. <laughs> I don't know. I just think it's fun to say his name Italian. Uh, Chicatello. Italian Mike. New character. I love it. <laughs> What's the shit on the boat? What? <laughs> no, we don't talk about the shit. We talk about this chicken parmesan with the penne and the meat sauce. It's some moi. Oh, boy. Anyways. <laughs> so. Well, they called you the Italian in college, right? Because of that big salami. <laughs> That's right, actually. Yeah. It's very good point, Dave. Thank you. I have that tattooed across my shoulders. The big salami. It's great. So anyways, back to the seriousness. Ian, where do we leave off with uh, this guy? Where we left off in part one with Andre Chicatello, he had taken almost a full year off following the last murder that he committed in August of 1985. There were no further victims found in either Rostov or Moscow Blast, whose bodies had the signature mutilations done by Chikatilo. And if we remember, the big one that stood out was the eyes being gouged out or severely wounded. Because that's that's the Russian tale. The last thing you see is what's imprinted on him for eternity, right? Right. Trying to get rid of those eyeballs. Investigators did link the murder of a 33-year-old woman named Lubov Golovaka, found stabbed to death in Rostov on July 23, 1986, to the investigation, although this was solely based on that the killer's semen type matched that of the killer they were seeking. That victim had been stripped naked prior to her murder and that she had been stabbed in excess of 20 times. The victim had not been dismembered or otherwise mutilated, nor had she been seen near mass transportation. Because of these discrepancies, many investigators expressed serious doubts as to whether Golovaka's murder had been committed by the killer they were seeking. Hmm. Do you guys know your semen type? Mine's delicious. Do you guys know yours? (laughs) Spicy with a hint of stale. I believe mine has been described. <laughs> so I don't know what that means. What, what are the different semen types? Like, is it sweet and sour, bitter, depending on like your level of pineapple consumption <laughs> right. for the prior past couple of days? I'm pretty sure you'll get drunk tasting mine with the amount of booze, you know. <laughs> Take a shot to the face and you're like, what am I so fucking wasted? <laughs> This is the best semen I've ever had. It's so good. It's the best. I didn't know that was a thing. I didn't either. What the more you know. Semen type. Yeah, so this is because we're back in the 80s. We're going to talk about, we alluded to it last week or kind of teased to it, that the rare thing that he has going on with his blood and his semen Um so since there was, there was no DNA or anything, mm-hmm. your semen will show your blood type. Really? So that's what they were going off of. So like to the so like that's a legitimate science that like your semen t- shows your blood type. Right. I was I was trying to do a little research into this, and it was very scientific. And I'm like, all right, well, I'm not going yeah. down this path. Like we can't. Get yeah, I, I did the same thing. Yeah. I'm like, nope, don't so understand had, any of this. I thought <laughs> I was going to sound real smart in this episode. I'm like, all they right. They had that too science much. down, but they didn't have like forensic science down. Yeah, right. Like <laughs> they can take molecules out of your semen and be like, oh, this is the same as his blood. <laughs> Meanwhile, this guy's killed like 1512 women. Right, right. For real. That's a number. 1512. <laughs> it's a big number, Mike. <laughs> Sorry. I'm drunk. I was drinking my semen. <laughs> on August 18, 1986, a victim was found buried in a shallow grave on the grounds of a collective farm in the city of Batesk. The wounds inflicted on this victim had the trademark mutilations of victims linked to Chicatello between 1982 and 1985. The victim was an 18-year-old secretary named Irina Pogorilova. She <clears throat> sounds like the number two ranked tennis player in the world right now. <laughs> Her body had been slit open from the neck to the genitalia with one breast removed and her eyes cut out. 
The murderer had made serious efforts this time to bury the body. Some investigators theorized that this explained the sudden drop in the number of victims found. Meaning he was doing a great job and actually burying them as opposed to just throwing leaves on them like he was doing before. <laughs> right. Yeah. Is it that hard to bury a body? I don't Like, if I wanted to bury a body, you would never find it. That's what I thought. But he didn't care it initially, right? Yeah, like, right. Like, I'll dig all night and I'll dig, you know, 10 feet down and it's not something you're, you're going to find. Well, until it's like good fellas and they build like property on it. And then you're like, we got to <laughs> fucking dig this thing up well, six right. months later. <laughs> By the fall of 1986, investigators in Rostov theorized that the unknown killer may have moved to another part of the Soviet Union and continued killing there. As the three victims killed in Rostov Oblast in 1985 and 1986 had died in August, some investigators gave credence to the possibility the perpetrator may have relocated to another part of the Soviet Union and may only be returning to Rostov Oblast in the summer. The Rostov police compiled bulletins to be sent to all forces throughout the Soviet Union, describing the pattern of wounds their unknown killer inflicted on his victims and requesting feedback from any police force who had discovered murdered victims with wounds matching those of the victims found in Rostov Oblast. Their response was negative, and this did not produce any leads. So at this point, this traveling murder show is working for him because he's kind of obscuring that it's him, right? And they're, they're focusing. They're not really linking them to him anymore. Right, and he's not he's not aggressive with people. Like when he... We're going to see later on when they put a surveil the surveillance on him. He doesn't uh, he doesn't pick a particular victim. It doesn't matter who it is. So he'll if someone doesn't want to talk to him in these train stations, he'll just move on to people over and over again until someone will engage him in a conversation. Because you want a more willing victim, someone that doesn't really want to talk to you. It's going to be a lot more work to overpower them. So and that makes right. sense. Yeah, it's a little different than. Um, than some serial killers like BTK, for example, where he he got fixed on a certain person like that is the person that I'm going to kill, you know, and he would yeah. stake out their house to Chikatilo is just the matter of just human suffering just to make someone suffer. It didn't yeah. matter. He doesn't care who and someone he thinks is going to fight back strong willed, you know, move on to the next person when well, it's still crazy. And this is just a reminder from part one. He was already on their radar. He was already like questioned about some oh, of these yeah. murders. So, you like, know, maybe a little bit of like just feeling invincible by him. I, yeah, absolutely. You've already murdered <clears throat> how many people the police question you and let you go. Like you're going to be feeling pretty, pretty good. <laughs> Can you imagine you got away with all those murders? Imagine you're if like, they just stopped. Yeah. They'd never find you. I think there's various points throughout the story where if he would just stop that they, we would never even know who he was. Right. Yeah. And I think that goes back to what you talked about last week, Dave, with how do you stop when you can't become sexually aroused by any other way? Right. Than seeing blood and seeing suffering. If the thing that gets you off is this, then yeah. You're never going to stop. You no, know, you're, in, you're in for a world of hurt. Or other people are in for a world of hurt. In 1987, Chikatilo killed three times. On each occasion, the murder took place while he was on a business trip far away from the Rostov Oblast, and none of these murders were linked to the manhunt. Chikatilo's first murder in 1987 was committed on May 16th when he encountered a 12-year-old boy named Olog Makarankov at a train station in the Urals. Makarankov was lured from the station with the promise of sharing a meal with Chikatilo. He was murdered in the woods close to the station, although his body would remain undiscovered until 1991. In July, he killed a 12-year-old boy named Ivan Bilovetsky in the Ukrainian city of Zaporizhia. And on September 15th, he killed a 16-year-old boy named Yuri Tereshanik in the woods on the outskirts of Leningrad. In 1988, Chikatilo killed three more times, murdering an unidentified woman in April and two boys in May and July. His first murder victim was lured off a train station before Chikatilo bound her hands behind her back and stuffed her mouth with dirt before severing her nose from her face and inflicting numerous knife wounds to her neck. Chikatilo then bludgeoned her to death with a slab of concrete. Her body was found on April 6th. 
investigators noted that the knife wounds were similar to those inflicted on victims that were linked to Chikatilo between 1982 and 1985. But because the woman was killed with a slab of concrete and not disemboweled, investigators were unsure whether to officially link this murder to the investigation. Mm, slab of concrete. It's tough. Doesn't sound like a great way to go. Mm-mm. In May, Chikatilo killed a nine-year-old boy named Aleski Veronko. The boy's wounds left no doubt that the killer had struck again, and this murder was linked to the manhunt. On July 14th, Chikatilo killed 15-year-old Yevgeny Miratov at a train station near Shakti. Miratov's murder was also linked to the investigation, although his body was not found until April of 1989. His remains were largely skeletal. His autopsy revealed he had been emasculated and suffered at least 30 knife wounds. Chick Tillo did not kill again until March 1st, 1989, when he killed a 16-year-old girl in his daughter's vacant apartment. He dismembered her body and hid the remains in a sewer. As the victim had not been dismembered, police did not link her murder to the investigation. Hmm. So what does that mean? This girl was staying in his daughter's apartment? He took her there. Like, it was vacant, and so he took her there, yeah. Gotcha. The pace of the murder seems to have slowed down. He's being sort of measured, I guess, right? Yeah, because at this time, too, he's where we ended in part one, he was starting to pay attention to the the investigation, like the news Mm -hmm. coverage and stuff. So he's not hitting that frantic, you know, point where it gets more rapid, less time in between, like a lot of these guys we talk about. He kind of already peaked, Mm. like, yeah, and slowed down. It's interesting. Yeah, like when we did Dahmer, I mean, he's he's a good kind of blueprint for that that cool down period. And then what they call like that berserker period, you know, he had his first mm-hmm. kill, took all those years off and then, you know, had another one kind of eased back into it. And then he just went off the rails at the end. Mm. So we seen like a cool down murder. Yeah. <laughs> mm. <laughs> I will. We should not trademark that one. <laughs> That'll come back to bite us in the know, ass at some point. Maybe we should. So it's so cool down murder. Every time like they use it in the media, the press, they're like, oh, pay us, motherfuckers. You guys ready for a cool down murder? <laughs> Cheers. You know what's funny? Just, just a little quick side note about that. I was talking to some people the other day, some listeners that had messaged. They always thought, and maybe this will be a you know the more you know for everybody. The um. The closing of our show, Ian asks if we want a cool down beer, mm-hmm. and then there's the can open, and Dave, you say cheers. Mm-hmm. They always assumed that that was you, Dave, opening the can mm. and saying cheers, and they were like, oh, they just leave Mike fucking out of this. <laughs> like, Ian wants a cool down beer, and Dave opens a beer and says cheers, and that's it. See? Uh, it is me that opens the beer. That's true. Dave typically has like the twist off Miller Lights, like the big old pint boys. So, yeah, the cans, that was, uh, that's me, so... I am partaking. I just don't say anything because I talk enough throughout the show. Behind the scenes of the gimmick. Yeah. See? Pulling back the curtain a little bit. Yeah. That's me that opens. So I'm not being... Ian and Dave are not leaving me out. Just want everyone to be clear. (laughs) (laughs) Between May and August 1989, Chikatilo killed a further four victims, three of whom were killed in Rostov and Shakti, although only two of these victims were linked to the killer. With the resurfacing of victims definitely linked to the manhunt, and the fact that the majority of these victims' bodies had been discovered close to railway stations, investigators assigned numerous plainclothes officers to discreetly film and photograph passengers on trains throughout the Rostov Oblast. Several trains were also equipped with hidden cameras with the intention of filming or photographing a victim in the company of his or her murderer. Wow, that's a lot of surveillance. On January 14th, 1990, Chikatilo encountered 11-year-old Andrei Kravchenko standing outside a Shakti theater. Kravchenko was lured from the theater on the pretext of being shown imported Western films Chikatilo claimed to have at his home. His extensively stabbed, emasculated body was found in a secluded section of woods the following month. You think like John Wayne movies or something? Watch That's what I was going to ask. Like 1990, what do you think they're showing him? Mm. Like new ones? Like True Grit? Old old 50s Western. Do you think that or do you think like more like newer ones? I don't know. Look here, Pilgrim. (laughs) I don't allow my movies to be viewed in the commie USSR. He would not be thrilled with that. (laughs) He wouldn't love it, right? He would not like that one bit. No, pinko commie bastards watching the true grit. (laughs) When did John Wayne die? 80s, I think. So he was dead by then. (laughs) 
So he would have no say. It's, it's the ghost of John. And he didn't own his own. Uh, his own Look movies. here, fuck nuts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's an all right one. Fuck nuts. You know, another underrated term, slap nuts. I like that one, too. What is it? Slap nuts. I've never heard that. Yeah. Um, like slapping your nuts? I, no, you call someone slap nuts. Jeff Jarrett used to do it back in the day in wrestling. Call people slap nuts. I would love for John Wayne to call me slap nuts. Mm. I would love for John Wayne to call me slap nuts. <laughs> Look here, slap nuts. <laughs> there it is. That's what I want. <laughs> John Wayne died in 1979. Oh, didn't quite make the I 80s. looked it up. Nope. Commie bastards. <laughs> <laughs> I want John Wayne calling people slap nuts to be a new thing. <laughs> All right, we can do that. <laughs> Seven weeks after Krevchenko's murder on March 7th, Chikato alerted a 10 year old boy named Yaroslav Markov from a Rostov train station to Rostov's botanical gardens. His eviscerated body was found the following day. So has he switched to boys at this point? It seems like it. Well, again, Dave, whoever will it's talk to him. The more opportunistic at this point, I guess, right? Yeah. It seems like it's either women or young boys, right? Yeah. But, and then young girls, too. I mean, it's it seems like it's all everyone. over the place. Jesus, he killed well, that lady and her But there's no, kid. there's no older men. You know, he hasn't... Does he have any adult men kills at this point, Ian? No, because I feel like so it's they women and children threatening. Yeah, yeah, they whoop his ass, Chikatilo, a little bitch. <laughs> <laughs> On March 11th, the leaders of the investigation, headed by Mikhail Festov, held a meeting to discuss progress made in the manhunt. Festov was under intense pressure from the public, the press, and the Ministry of the Interior in Moscow to solve the case. So Fedosov was the colonel, right? In charge of the whole thing? Yeah. It's reminding people from last week. The intensity of the manhunt in the years up to 1984 had receded between 85 and 87 when Chikatilo had committed only three murders. However, by March 1990, a further six victims had been linked to the killer. In addition, following the introduction of greater media freedom, the Soviet news media was much less repressed than it had been in the early years of the manhunt and devoted extensive publicity to the case. Festov had noticed uh, a lot of laziness in some areas of the investigation and warned people that they would be fired if the killer was not caught soon. You mean, would that be part of like you questioned the killer and then you let him go? <laughs> Perhaps. <laughs> that wasn't great, right? Yeah. Although freedom of the press here, see, it's getting them to work. Freedom of the press, always good. I don't disagree. Yeah. Light a fire under their asses. The more you know. Am I yeah. right? We can make fun of these cops all they want because they're just fucking Soviet cops. So <laughs> who the fuck cares? The KGB. Right. Chikatilo had killed three further victims by August 1990. On April 4th, he lured a 31-year-old woman named Lubav Zoyeva off a train and killed her in the woods near a train station. Her body was not found until August 24th. On July 28th, he lured a 13-year-old boy named Viktor Petrov away from a Rostov railway station and killed him in Rostov's botanical gardens. And on August 14th, he killed an 11-year-old boy named Ivan Fomin in the reeds near a local beach. The discovery of more victims sparked a more intense police operation. Because several victims' bodies had been discovered at railway stations, on one railroad through the Rostov Oblast, Viktor Burkov, who was um, another one of the, the lead investigators on this, suggested a plan to fill all larger train stations in the Rostov Oblast with an obvious uniformed police presence, which the killer could not fail to notice. And see, he suggested last week that they man the, the railway stations. He was right all along. Yeah. The intention of this was to discourage the killer from attempting to strike at any of these locations and to have undercover agents patrol smaller and less busy stations where the murderer's activities would be more likely to be noticed. It's smart. Kind of filtering them down to where you can watch uh, yeah. them. Yeah. Hell yeah. They should have had, I, I think, like train station employees like this whole time watching ticket takers. I don't know. The janitors. Or can you not just put, you know. Just on the lookout on, you, you know, uh, unarmed police or not uniformed police as those like a ticket taker or a janitor. Something like, like give that, him a role as right? a janitor. Yeah, right. right. That's who knows, David. It's the Soviets. I don't know. I mean, Ian, speaking of janitors, did you know they used to call Mike the janitor in college? 
Oh, yeah? And he always was running to get a bucket and a mop, all the wet-ass pussy that was in his, <laughs> in his, in his room. Can confirm. <laughs> Can confirm. <laughs> wop, wop, wop. That's some wet-ass <laughs> pussy. That, I mean, yeah. They called my dorm room Niagara Falls because there was so much water just leaking out. Water, juices, whatever you want to call it. It was wetness. <laughs> What do you want from me? I did what I, I did. I want some D. That's what I want. <laughs> I thought we were role playing with, the, I'm re- oh, with your girls. Oh, sorry. Cars. No, well, I'm retired now, please. That was back in my younger days. Now, of course, you know, I'm out of the game. I'm a Hall of Famer, of course. Oh, of course you, know, you are. I got my, my, you know, yellow jacket or whatever they give you. I'm out of that game now. Whew. The plan was approved and both uniformed and undercover officers were instructed to question any adult man in the company of a young woman or child and note his name and passport number. Police deployed 360 men at all the stations in the Rostov Oblast, but only undercover officers were posted at the three smallest stations on the route through the Oblast where the killer had struck most frequently in an effort to force the killer to strike at one of these three stations. The operation was implemented on October 27th, 1990. It's a smart plan, by the way. Yeah, that's the best plan they've had so far. Yeah, exactly. I agree. On October 30th, police found the body of a 16-year-old boy named Vadim Gromov near one of the large train stations. The wounds on Gromov's body immediately linked his murder to the manhunt. The boy had been strangled, stabbed 27 times, and castrated with the tip of his tongue severed and his left eye stabbed. Ugh, hot damn. Gromov had been killed on October 17th, 10 days before the start of the operation. The same day Gromov's body was found, Chikatel lured another 16-year-old boy, Viktor Tyshenko, off a train at another station under surveillance from undercover police and killed him in a nearby forest. Tyshenko's body with, with 40 separate knife wounds was found on November 3rd. Do you think he spotted any of these undercovers there and knew? I wonder. I, like, I don't know, know, but it's not working. Yeah, I'm going to go about my business anyway. What the fuck are those undercover cops doing then? Like, I, how are you not? Like, you, you think they should stop every man walking with a young boy? That's tough. I, I don't, don't necessarily it's, it's agree setup. with that method. Right. But if that is literally your job and you're able to do it, why would you not be? Because well, I think there's probably a lot of guys walking with the... Their sons around. Maybe so. Yeah, I don't know. It's a different world. For the record, I don't agree with cops stopping every single person that might meet somewhat of a description. You don't? I'm just saying, in this time, I think they were allowed to get away with it. So if you're the cop, why would you not do you it? Do whatever you want over there. Probably. On November 6th, 1990, Chikatilo killed and mutilated a 22-year-old woman named Svetlana Karostik in woods near one of the larger train stations. Returning to the railway platform, he was observed by an undercover officer who saw Chikatilo approach a well and wash his hands and face. When he approached the station, the undercover officer also noted that Chikatilo's coat had grass and dirt stains on the elbows. Chikatilo also had a small red smear on his cheek and what appeared to be a severe wound on one of his fingers. Getting a little sloppy here, Chikatilo. Um, To the undercover officer, Chikatilo looked suspicious. The only reason people entered the woods near that station at that time of year was to gather wild mushrooms, but Chikatilo was not dressed like a typical forest scavenger. He was wearing more formal clothing. Moreover, he had a nylon sports bag, which was unsuitable for carrying mushrooms. The officer stopped Chikatilo and checked his papers, but had no formal reason to arrest him. When the officer returned to his office, he filed a routine report containing the name of the person he had stopped at the station and the possible blood smear observed upon his cheek. Ian, what exactly is a suitable bag for carrying mushrooms, <laughs> do you think? You know I mean, he's just he's <laughs> a curious mind. Like He doesn't need to know for any specific reason. He just, just, I wonder what bag is suitable to be picking mushrooms in. I don't know. Uh, like, you're not mushroom-picking material, fella. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> I was trying to think of a fungi pun, but I got nothing. <laughs> what's the difference between mike and a mushroom one's a fun guy and the other one's mike 
<laughs> How hard was that, Dave? Come on. I mean, a bag, a fungi bag. Oh. Like, well, that, that's pretty good, though. I mean, I'm a fungi. I got a bag. <laughs> Holds my nuts. <laughs> On November 13th, Krostik's body was found. She was the 36th known victim linked to the manhunt. Police summoned the officer in charge of surveillance at that particular train station and examined the reports of all men stopped and questioned in the previous week. Not only was Chikatilo's name among those reports, but it was familiar to several officers involved in the case because, like you were saying earlier, Mike, he had been questioned in 1984 and had been placed on a 1987 suspect list compiled and distributed throughout the Soviet Union. Thank you, Ian, for acknowledging I remembered something for once ever. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> <laughs> They're like, that motherfucker, we had him. Yeah, for real. Like, mm. God damn. You're already getting heat from like your bosses and from the media. And he was right fucking there the whole time. Yeah. After checking with Chikatilo's present and previous employers, investigators were able to place him in various towns and cities at times when several victims linked to the investigation had been murdered. God damn it, traveling, not coming back to haunt him, right? Yeah. Helped him earlier. Now they're pinning it on him. Questioning of former colleagues from Chikatilo's teaching days revealed that he had been forced to resign from two teaching positions due to repeated complaints of sexual assault made by his students. So maybe if we didn't, do, if they didn't do that whole communist, the whole school gets in trouble thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> None of this shit would have even right. have happened. Police placed Chikatilo under surveillance on November 14th. In several instances, particularly on trains or buses, he was seen approaching lone young women or children and starting conversation with them. If the woman or child broke off the conversation, Chikatilo would wait a few minutes and then seek out another person to talk to so who does that? So they know they got him at this point. I yeah, agree. Like, that's pretty obvious. I do everything in the world possible to avoid children. This guy's <laughs> trying to talk to everyone he finds. You literally don't go <laughs> see movies anymore because of children. No, I do not. On November 20th, after six days of surveillance, Chikatel left his house with a large jar, which he had filled with beer at a small kiosk in a local park before he wandered around attempting to make contact with children he met on his way. Upon exiting a cafe, Chikatilo was arrested by four plainclothes police officers. Let's just point out that everything in the Soviet Union was not terrible. Because if you could just take a jar to your house and walk to the park and have uh, a kiosk fill it with beer, that's <laughs> that's pretty good. So I'm, I was going to say earlier, like, <laughs> that's awesome. When I read these notes, I was like, yeah, that that sounds OK. Yeah. Like, I can get down with that. It's going to walk outside and take a jar with me. And the guy at the park's going to fill it with beer. Right. I like instead of a water fountain, it's like a beer fountain. That, that's pretty good. Pretty, pretty <laughs> good. <laughs> Upon his arrest, Chikatilo gave a statement claiming that the police were mistaken and complained that he had also been arrested in 1984 for the same series of murders. A strip search revealed a further piece of evidence. One of Chikatilo's fingers had a significant wound. Medical examiners concluded the wound was from a human bite. One of Chikatilo's recent male victims, Viktor Chevchenko, was a very physically strong teenager. At the crime scene, the police had found numerous signs of a violent physical struggle between the victim and his murderer. Although a finger bone was later found to be broken and his fingernail had been bitten off, Chikatilo never sought medical treatment for these injuries. Mm. So <laughs> we... <why>. Yeah. <laughs> So he lost his nail, but did we just nail him? <laughs> <laughs> what you I thought at? you were going to go with the, yeah! <laughs> <laughs> they pointed at I me. Pointed and I pointed at like, him. I thought he'd get it. <laughs> <laughs> I would have, I wanted, I wanted a better setup, Dave. Like, <laughs> so he lost his nail, but did we nail him? <laughs> yeah! <laughs> also, you need to take your glasses off. Come on, man. Sorry. <laughs> take those glasses off. I know exactly what you're trying to tell me to do. <laughs> CSI Miami, the greatest CSI, opening ever. CSI Medina, <laughs> the greatest opening ever. <laughs> a search of Chikatilo's belongings revealed he had been in possession of a folding knife and two lengths of rope. A sample of Chikatilo's blood was taken and he was placed in a cell 
inside the KGB headquarters in Rostov with a police informer who was instructed to engage Chikatilo in conversation and get any information he could from him. I mean, in, in all fairness, he could have been carrying the, the rope in case someone fell in quicksand and he had to rescue them. You never know. <laughs> I, it happens. I carry it with me 24-7. I, that's what I'm saying. And you carry a folding knife in case you have to cut the rope. Right. Just being safe. Absolutely. The next day, November 21st, formal questioning of Chikatilo began. The interrogation was performed by Isa Kostoyev. The strategy chosen by police to get a confession was to lead Chikatilo to believe he was a very sick individual in need of medical help. The intention was to give Chikatilo hope that if he confessed, he would not be prosecuted by reason of insanity. Police knew their case against Chikatilo was largely circumstantial, and under Soviet law, they had 10 days in which they could legally hold a suspect before either charging or releasing him. So I'm guessing they don't care if you want your attorney present. <laughs> I don't think so. I don't think so either. I'm surprised they had a 10-day limit, to be completely yeah, honest. Yeah, right. Also Just true. Never see him again. On November 21st, the results of Chikatilo's blood test again revealed his blood type to be A and not type AB. Mm. Due to the amount of physical and circumstantial evidence investigators had thus far compiled, which indicated Chikatilo was indeed the murderer they, that they had been pursuing, plus the fact the investigators had the blood type of the murderer they had pursued using semen samples obtained from the clothing and bodies of 14 victims, as opposed to actual blood samples, investigators obtained a sample of Chikatilo's semen to test his blood type the results of which confirmed that Chikatilo's semen was type AB, whereas his blood and saliva were type A. That's still confusing to me. Which it's I, a whole bunch yeah, of science. It's a lot of science. Again, I went, you tried. you're going to have to you go tried. Google by yourself. <laughs> I just thought it would be too confusing if so we got into it. But His blood, I, I, blood type and his semen type don't match. But there's like different differentials in the semen blood type when it's extracted. I, I, I think... The scientists or the forensic people over here got a lot of flack when they said that because I don't I, I like people in the U.S. So that's not possible for them to right? differ for them to differ for them to differ something like really? that. Like they were criticized for the for this when in fact it's yeah, just a unique individual. Yeah. Like from what I read, it took me down a, like the science, all that science and stuff took me down a path of um, like, you know, a chimera in the cryptid world is like a. a mashup of animals and whatever yeah there's a thing called that they call a chimera in genetics and it has to do with this and like i like we were saying like you were saying it's like all the science i mean there was like a whole bunch of different uh variables between blood types and mm -hmm. what it can cause and there's even a thing out that was reading under the chimera aspect of genetics where if there's twins and one twin absorbs the other mm. while they're um, while they're inside the mother. That can cause this to happen. Interesting. Yeah. So maybe his brother, they told him, got eaten by cannibals, was actually a twin that he absorbed. That. Mind blown. Whew. <laughs> so if you guys want a further explanation, call Bill Nye, the science guy. He'll explain it. <laughs> It's beyond my comprehension. <laughs> no more science <laughs> questions the rest of this episode. <laughs> but, you know, for this stage of, you know, forensics and, and DNA and things, I learned no DNA, but just forensics, mm -hmm. this really made him like the perfect predator. They could, yeah, because they couldn't, they couldn't figure it out. Throughout the questioning, Chikatil repeatedly denied that he had committed the murders, although he did confess to molesting his students during his career as a teacher. He also produced several written essays, which, although evasive regarding the actual murders, did reveal psychological symptoms consistent with those predicted by Dr. Bukanovsky in the 1985 psychological profile he had written for investigators. The interrogation tactics used may have also caused Chikatel to become defensive. The informant sharing a KGB cell with Chikatel reported to police that Chikatel had informed him that Kostoyev had repeatedly asked him direct questions regarding the mutilations done to victims. He's writing essays as part of his interrogation. I mean, I know the guy's a teacher, but that, that is yeah. weird. <laughs> it's kind of weird. He's here. Write us an essay. I would just sit there and I would be nonverbal. They had nothing. They couldn't like they would. Have, they didn't really have all that much. They thought they had them, but they, well, you know, 
back then they just cut off your finger though if you wow. didn't talk. <laughs> so true. You're gonna tell us more. You're gonna write an essay. You're gonna write an essay. We'll be right back. Is there something interfering with your happiness? Something keeping you from achieving your 2020 goals? Let's face it. These are certainly trying times. From being cooped up inside your home to wondering how you're going to pay next month's bills, we're all experiencing some form of stress or strain on our mental health. And for that, BetterHelp is here for us. BetterHelp is an online mental health provider that will assess your needs and match you up with your own licensed professional therapist. The best part? No waiting rooms. That's a pretty big deal if you're as impatient as I am. BetterHelp is a safe and private online environment that will have you communicating with a counselor within the first 24 hours. And once you've begun, you can send your counselor a message at any time, always getting a helpful response in a timely manner. You even have the ability to schedule weekly video or phone sessions, all from the comfort of your very own couch. BetterHelp is available worldwide and has a broad range of expertise available, including licensed professional counselors who specialize in depression, stress, anxiety, relationships, sleeping, trauma, anger, family conflict, LGBT matters, grief, and self-esteem. In fact, so many people have been using BetterHelp that they're currently recruiting additional counselors in all 50 states. Not happy with your counselor? No worries. BetterHelp is committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches and makes it easy and free to change counselors if needed. Remember, everything you share with your BetterHelp counselor is completely confidential. And while it's not a crisis line, it is a convenient, professional, and affordable way to seek the help you deserve. Financial aid is even offered to those who qualify. Want to hear how BetterHelp assisted people just like you? Check out the testimonials posted daily on their site. Look, we here at Necronomapod want you to start living a happier life. So, as a listener, you'll get 10% off your first month by visiting betterhelp.com slash necro. Join over 1 million people already taking charge of their mental health. Again, that's betterhelp, better H-E-L-P dot com slash necro. We like to drink beer. A lot of it. After a long night of drinking and talking crime and conspiracies, there's nothing that wakes us up and gets us ready to start the day better than just brew coffee. With a great selection of roast levels to choose from, you're guaranteed to find one that suits your style. Small batch roasted to highlight the unique features of each coffee bean, Just Brew Coffee caters to both casual and hardcore coffee drinkers alike. Since 2010, Just Brew Coffee has worked tirelessly to perfect the roasting process and technique, which has resulted in seriously delicious, always flavorful, and never bitter tasting coffee. If you're already drinking JBC, raise your mug. If you're not, raise your standards. Check out their online store at youjustbrew.com and up your coffee game today. Use code NECRO15 to receive 15% off your order of two pounds or more. And remember, they roast, you just brew. On November 29th, at the request of Burkhoff and Festov, Dr. Alexander Bukanovsky was invited to assist in the questioning of Chikatilo. And this is, goes back to what you brought up last week, Mike, with mm -hmm. Bukanovsky's psychological profile. From everything I saw, it's accurate that he wrote that in real time because when he was brought in, they had him read parts of that 65-page psychological profile to Chikatilo. It's pretty impressive, man. Within two hours, Chikatilo burst into tears and confessed to Bukanovsky that he was indeed guilty of the crimes for which he had been arrested. After talking into the evening, Bukanovsky reported to Burkov and Festov that Chikatilo was ready to confess. Like Kesha says, yeah, you got me. <laughs> <laughs> that was on my shovel today. I had it in the back of my head. I don't know why. Where do you go from there? We'll see you guys next week. Like, that's it. <laughs> Tick tock, don't stop. <laughs> Tick tock, don't stop. <laughs> all the words i know uh 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 oh uh 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 oh <laughs> i love kesha armed with the handwritten notes bukanovsky had prepared isa kostoyev prepared a formal accusation of murder dated november 29th the eve of the expiration of the 10-day time period for which chikatilo could legally be held before being charged the following morning kostoyev resumed the interrogation according to the official protocol 
Chikatilo confessed to 34 of the 36 murders police had linked to him. Although he denied two additional murders con- committed in 1986, the police had initially believed he had committed. Chikatilo gave a full detailed description of each murder on the list of charges, all of which were consistent with known facts regarding each killing. When asked, he could draw a rough sketch of various crime scenes indicating the position of the victim's bodies and various landmarks to the vicinity of the crime scene. Additional details provided further proof of his guilt. One victim on the list of charges was a 19-year-old student named Anna Lemesheva, who Chikatilo had killed on July 19, 1984, near a Shakti station. Chikatilo recalled that he had fought to overpower her, and she stated that a man named Bars would retaliate for his attacking of her. Lemesheva's fiance had the nickname Bars tattooed on his hand. Mm. It is interesting that he can recall such detail on each killing. The it's wild because there were so many people. Yeah, like That's a lot of details just to be able to categorize that in your head. He loved it. In many instances, in many instances particularly with his male victims, Chikatilo stated he would bind the victim's hands behind their back with a length of rope before he would proceed to kill them. He would typically inflict a number of knife wounds on the victim, initially inflicting shallow knife wounds to the chest area before deeper stab and slash wounds usually 30 to 50 in total, before proceeding to eviscerate the victim as he imitated raping the victim until he achieved orgasm. So that's a very strange detail that he would imitate because remember, he couldn't get hard. Right. He would he would still have an orgasm, but not be hard. So he would fake that he was raping them. Damn. That's what that's what would get him off. The orgasms all in your brain. Yeah, it's wild. Hmm. Uh -uh. Uh, uh, uh. (laughs) he stated that he had become good at avoiding the spurts of blood from his victims bodies as he inflicted the knife wounds and eviscerations on them and would regularly sit or squat beside his victims until their hearts had stopped beating adding that the victims quote cries the blood and the agony gave me relaxation and a certain pleasure that's pretty sadistic yeah, and that's the thing. When I re- when I read that detail, that it kind of made me think. Like, yeah, this guy's doing this stuff near train stations. You would think with that amount of brutality, he would be covered in blood. Yeah, right, for sure. But like he said, he figured out wh- like if he stabbed somebody a certain way, blood would shoot mm-hmm. out, so he could avoid it. Like stabbing someone fifty times and not getting any blood all over you. Well, in all fairness, he was stopped once at a police station with blood on his cheek, and they let him go. That's also true. So, but you just would assume someone would be just covered. You, I agree. When you stab someone, they still times. did. They stopped a man with blood on his cheek, and oh. it was all disheveled, and had like grass <laughs> on his coat, and they let him go. I cut my finger <laughs> doing something in the woods. It's nice. <laughs> I like your pimples. <laughs> <laughs> When questioned as to why most of his later victims' eyes had been stabbed and or slashed, but not gouged as the earlier victims' eyes had been, Chikatilo stated he had initially believed in old Russian superstition that the image of a murderer is left imprinted on the eyes of a victim. However, he stated, quote, in later years, he had become convinced that this was simply an old wives' tale, and he ceased to gouge out the victim's eyes. He just didn't give a fuck anymore. He stopped caring in his old age. Yeah, yeah, he got sloppy. Chikatilo also informed Kostoyev he had often tasted the blood of his victims, to which he stated, quote, felt chills and, quote, shook all over. Blah. He also confessed to tearing out victims' genitalia, lips, nipples, and tongues with his teeth. In several instances, Chikatilo would cut or bite off the tongue of his victim As he performed his eviscerations, then either at or shortly after the point of death, run around the body as he held the tongue in one hand in a bizarre ritual type thing. That's pretty weird. It's a little different. Could you imagine being like like a fly on the wall for that? No. (laughs) Yeah, no. No. I mean, that's fucking (laughs) That that is a crazy visual. Cut their tongue out, hold it, and run around the body. It's fucking weird. Not even cut it. Bite it out with your fucking teeth. Also true. 
Although he also admitted that he had chewed on the excised uterus of his female victims and the testicles of his male victims, he stated he had later discarded these body parts. Regardless, Chikatilo did confess to having swallowed the nipples and tongues of some of his victims. Oh, boy. On November 30th, Chikatilo was formally charged with each of the 34 murders he had confessed to, all of which had been committed between June 1982 and November 1990. On the following days, he confessed to a further 22 killings, which had not been connected to the case, either because the murders had been committed outside the Rostov Oblast because the bodies had not been found, or, in the case of Yelena Zakhanova, because an innocent man had been convicted and executed for the murder. So that guy, they, they uh, firing squad. Right, right. yeah. They retry- or they found him in 15 years, and the family didn't like it, so like, eh, we'll do it over. Huh, guilty. Firing squad. Hey, you, you, know guys, really you guys keep crazy. supporting your capital punishment. <laughs> oh, maybe Chikatilo could have came to live at your house, Mike. <laughs> hey, maybe. <laughs> Maybe so. Yeah, yeah. But that's not about him. This is about the other guy, the innocent guy. <laughs> you know, a really crazy detail about the guy that was uh, that was executed for this. When all this went down, they caught Chikatilo and and all this happened. Yeah. The government, they sent people to that guy's mother's house to tell her, like, you know, apologize. Like, hey, you know, we accidentally uh, executed your son. <laughs> oopsies she she didn't even know he had been executed she thought he was just like an asshole and hadn't talked really oh yeah so yeah they showed up and they're like oh yeah you know our bad we we executed him she's like wait what like i thought i just haven't talked to him in years oh my gosh Mm. they were like motherfucker we could have just not showed up to her house (laughs) right she would never know In December of 1990, Chikatilo started leading police to bodies of victims. He led the police to the body of Oleski Kobotov, a boy he had confessed to killing in August of 1989 and whom he had buried in woods near Ashakti Cemetery, proving further that he was the killer. He later led investigators to the bodies of two other victims he had confessed to killing. Three of the 56 victims Chikatilo confessed to killing could not be found or identified, but Chikatilo was charged with killing 53 women and children between 1978 and 1990. And just by coincidence, he was held in the same cell in Ras Don where he had been t- detained on November 20th, back in 1984, when they first questioned him. Wow. Damn. It all comes around, doesn't it? Yeah. Is he the most prolific serial killer in Russian history? I mean, besides Joseph Stalin, I was just going to say, I was like, no, <laughs> nope. Who could have killed as many as 20 million yeah, people? Seriously. Serial killer wise. I mean, he's got to be right. I don't know. Ian's the expert. You know what? I'm not, I, I don't know a ton about Russian serial killers, but I would assume he's it. He's the main guy I think of. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know any others. Yeah. I'm still if convinced talking, he's Italian, but whatever. <laughs> Chikatilo. <laughs> If you're talking just serial killers in general, Gary Ridgway still has that. Yeah. USA. USA. <laughs> USA. Yeah, we, could, we beat the world in that category. Even Golden State had more, right? What was his number? I'm pretty sure if you list like the top 10, it's all USA. Well, yeah. Yeah. Golden State was the most prolific rapist. He killed, what, 13 people? Yeah, of course. Oh, sure. that's right. His, yeah. The, the victim yeah. count. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, Gary Ridgway, he uh, he got away with that forever. He's still alive, right? Ridgway's yeah, still around, he's, right? Yeah, he's hanging out and... Okay, I like to bang uh, hookers in the car with his little kid in the... That's right. That was that episode. kid in the car. He liked his his yeah. uh, prostitutes. Dad, 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 why are you peeping <laughs> in the hooker's mouth? <laughs> it's a classic Necronomapod episode. Available Gary in the archives. Ridgway. <laughs> That's a popular one. Da, da, what? That's <laughs> <laughs> oh, funny. On August 20th, 1991, after police had completed their interrogation, including reenactments of all the murders at each crime scene, Chikatilo was transferred to an institute in Moscow to undergo a 60-day psychiatric evaluation to determine whether he was mentally competent to stand trial. 
Chikatilo was analyzed by senior psychiatrist Dr. Andre Tichenko. Tichenko did note Chikatilo suffered from various physiological problems, which he attributed to prenatal brain damage, but concluded on October 18th that although suffering from borderline personality disorder with sadistic features, he was fit to stand trial. In December 1991, details of Chikatilo's arrest and a brief summary of his crimes were released to the newly corporate Russian media by the police. So it's a water on the brain shit we talked about last week. Pre- yeah, and I didn't know brain about that. damage. Yeah. Andre Chikatilo was brought to trial in Rostov on April 14, 1992, charged with 53 counts of murder, in addition to five charges of sexual assault against minors committed when he had been a teacher. Hasn't the statute of limitations expired on the teacher stuff? I mean, come on. It wasn't even a serial killer at that point. That's true. That was a long time ago. Long time ago. I was only joking. Come on. <laughs> When, when, when did that happen? Early oh, 70s, yeah. right? When he was a teacher. When was his first kill? 78, See, trivia is not very easy, is it, 78, fellas? 79? Well, it's easier for us than you. It's true. We, it's still we wrong. write the questions. It's really easy. <laughs> <laughs> you lose the match, so we write the questions. It's true. Yeah, he, he jumped from school to school for a while. Yeah. That whole communism thing, no one wanted to turn him in. Chikatilo's trial was the first major media event of the liberalized post-Soviet Russia. Shortly after his psychiatric evaluation, investigators conducted a press conference in which a full list of Chikatilo's crimes was released to the press. The media first saw Chikatilo on his first day of trial as he entered in an iron cage specifically constructed in a corner of the courtroom to protect him from attack by the enraged and often hysterical relatives of his victims. That they just like brought him in there, like Hannibal Lecter style. Yeah, yeah, you can watch it on YouTube. There's a video of the trial and everything. It's uh, it's a wild scene. Probably not the best situation to uh, no, and bring they, they were it was uh, it was heated in there. He looks absolutely insane with that fucking shaved head, though. Yeah, he's he's scary looking. Yeah, I guess that's what they did. They just all the convicts they shaved their head like that, but he looks crazy. In the opening weeks of Chikatilo's trial, the Russian press regularly published exaggerated and often sensationalized headlines about the murders, referring to Chikatilo as being a, quote, cannibal or, quote, maniac, and his looks resembling a, quote, shaven skull demonic individual. Can't confirm. That's, that's accurate. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly what he looks like. The first two days of trial were devoted to the judge reading the long lists of indictments against Chikatilo. Each murder was discussed individually and on several occasions, relatives present in the courtroom broke down in tears or fainted when details of their relatives' murders were revealed. After reading the indictment, the judge announced to the journalist present in the courtroom his intention to conduct an open trial, stating, quote, Let this trial at least teach us something so that this will never happen anytime or anywhere again. I'm not sure you're getting a fair trial when that's how the judge Starts the proceedings. I agree. I'm also wondering why he, there's a trial if he confessed to everything. Yeah, yeah. I'm guessing a couple of years earlier in the Soviet Union before it dissipated uh, might have been a different trial. Probably. Right? Yeah, a lot of this behavior that we're going to get into throughout this trial, I would lean towards that in the old Soviet Union. They would have just killed him and been yeah, done with this. Absolutely. Absolutely. The judge then asked Chikatilo to stand, identify himself, and provide his date of his date and location of birth. Chikatilo complied, although this would be one of the only few civil exchanges between the judge and Chikatilo. Chikatilo was initially questioned in detail about each charge on the indictment, responding to specific questions regarding the murder. Responding to specific questions regarding the murders, he often gave dismissive replies to the questions, particularly when questioned as to the specific nature of the wounds he had inflicted on his victims and how he lured the victims to the locations where he had killed them. He would become angry only when accused of stealing personal possessions from the victims or to his retaining organs cut from the victims missing from the crime scenes. On one occasion when asked... As to his seeming indifference as to the lifestyle and gender of those he had killed, Chikatilo replied, quote, I did not need to look for them. Every step I took, they were there. Well, that's some serious victim blaming, I think. Plus, the one thing he gets mad at when they accuse him of stealing, he's like, hey, motherfuckers, I'm no thief. (laughs) 
you yeah, call me this thing. and you call me that, but I'm no thief. Might be a, all race, right? a, a rapist and a murderer, but yeah. I'm no fucking thief. <laughs> I didn't steal 25 cents out of their pocket. <laughs> I did. Do you see that as like I took that statement as meaning like just anywhere he looked, he was turned on by people. Like he couldn't help it. They were everywhere. Yeah. I didn't search for them. They were standing right in front of me. That's what I took that as. I didn't take that as necessarily arrogant, just more so like I didn't have to try. Like any, like I just looked and yeah. there were, there, you know, there's always women and children around. Sure. Yeah. Who knows? In what became a regular occurrence throughout the trial, the judge berated Chicatello as he questioned him in detail to the charges, ordering him to, quote, shut your mouth before adding, quote, you're not crazy. As Chicatello's responses to questions deviated into his discussing issues, such as the repression his family had endured throughout his childhood and claiming that the charges filed against him were false. These verbal exchanges would occur whether Chicatello was cooperative or uncooperative throughout the proceedings. And the manner in which the judge questioned Chicatello repeatedly led Chicatello's defense lawyer to protest against the accusatory nature of the court proceedings. In the instances in which Chikatil was uncooperative throughout questioning, he would simply shout over the judge, denounce the court as a farce, and launch into rambling speeches. On some occasions, Chikatil would also expose himself to the court or sing socialist movement anthems throughout the proceedings. This behavior regularly resulted in him being returned to his cell as court <laughs> proceedings continued without him. Hey, look at my penis! <laughs> That's what doing I'm doing. The old meat spin. <laughs> <laughs> Meatspin.com. I didn't kill nobody. <laughs> oh, I didn't kill a nobody. You look at the sausage. <laughs> my name is Andre Chicatello. <laughs> you get some of my garlic bread. <laughs> you want the salami and your pie? <laughs> <laughs> I'm giving you the meat sauce. <laughs> Jesus. It's Italian stuff's pretty funny. <laughs> no basis for it, but no, it's of funny. Course not. <laughs> <laughs> this was the moment in re in in writing this that I'm like old Soviet Union when they had to return him to a cell, they probably just would have killed him and Yeah. Done. We're like, like yeah, yeah, we're done, pal. Yeah. yeah. Enough of this. <laughs> Bye. On April 21st, Chikatilo's defense lawyer requested that Dr. That Dr. Bukanovsky be allowed to testify as to the contents of his 1985 psychological profile he had written and subsequent conversations with Chikatilo following his arrest, adding that Bukanovsky could have influence over Chikatilo and, by extension, might influence the court proceedings. This request was denied. The same day, Chikatilo began to refuse to answer any questions from the judge the prosecutor, or his own defense lawyer. He refused to answer any questions for three consecutive days before stating his presumption of innocence had been violated by the judge and that he intended to give no further testimony. The following day, proceedings were adjourned for two weeks. Chikatilo withdrew his confession to six of the killings for which he had been charged on May 13th and also claimed he had killed four further victims who were not included in the indictment. That same day, his defense lawyer again submitted a request that his client be subjected to a second psychiatric evaluation. Chikatil repeated his earlier remarks as to the judge making numerous rash remarks prejudging his guilt. So he retracted one confession but made another one. That's what it yeah, sounds so like. He, okay. he re yeah, he retracted six of the con six people that he, that he previously said he killed. He said he didn't kill those six, but then added four more to the list. Is he is he kind of doing a Bundy trying to extend his his days by saying, oh, I killed another four people you don't know about. Like, didn't Bundy do that when he was about to be executed? Yeah, Bundy, he drug that out as long as yeah. he could. It's like, no, I, I, think, I got some more people I could tell you about. And they're like, yeah, you're done. Pal. I think him like all his craziness and then like this taking six off, but adding four more. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like he's trying really, really hard to get that insanity defense or yeah, acquittal. That makes sense. I think a lot of this from him was a show. Yeah. It's just, it's still so weird to me that he like, he's, he's already admitted to all these killings yet. They're still having like this, this trial. And I know now he's changing his story. So it makes things a little bit more convoluted, yeah. but like, 
he came into this heading having what admitted to like 50 some murders yet we're going through all of this yeah. was it for public shaming from the judge but that's not uncommon in this country either I and mean, they confess you still have the trial though to decide right we just did one when it was like this where they confessed to everything I don't know, it just seems weird. It's, like, if you already confessed weird. to everything, sure. why are you having the whole trial? Like, what evidence do you need to... Like, he's already admitted to it. Yeah. I don't know. That's... I'm sure there is some reasoning, but this is just weird. Because now you're just giving him, like, the platform to do all this bullshit. Mm -hmm. And the platform for the judge to just ridicule him. Mm -hmm. Well, all that ridicule from the judge even led to the prosecutor vocally supporting the defense's claim, stating that the judge had indeed made too many... Con too many comments and had committed numerous procedural violations in his lecturing and insulting of Chikatilo. See, that's yeah. that's crazy. On July 3rd, Bukanovsky was permitted to testify as to his analysis of Chikatilo, although solely in the capacity as a witness. For three hours, Bukanovsky testified as to his 1985 psychological profile of Chikatilo and of the conversations he held with Chikatilo following his arrest, which had resulted in Chikatilo's confession. Four psychiatric experts also testified as to the results of behavioral analysis they had conducted on Chikatilo in May, following the initial adjournment of the trial. All testified as to his behavior in the courtroom being strikingly in contrast to his behavior in his cell, and that they considered his behavior to be a calculated attempt to obtain acquittal on the grounds of insanity. There you go. On August 9th, the defense delivered their closing arguments before the judge. Upon beginning his 90-minute closing argument, Chikatilo's attorney first stated he had no confidence his voice would be heard above the, quote, general outcry for retribution against Chikatilo before questioning the reliability of the forensic evidence presented at the trial and describing areas of Chikatilo's confession as being, quote, baseless. Even though he led him to all these bodies that they didn't even <laughs> right. know about before. It's weird he had that information. Hmm. Baseless. The following day, the prosecutor delivered his closing argument before the judge. Leaning towards the earlier testimony of psychiatrists at the trial, he argued that Chikatilo fully understood the criminality of his actions was able to resist his homicidal impulses and made numerous conscious efforts to avoid detection. Moreover, he emphasized that in 19 of the charges, the material evidence of the crimes had been provided by Chikatilo himself. The prosecutor then recited each of the charges before formally requesting the death penalty. It's hard to refute when half the evidence pool is like what you gave them in your confession and you led them to the bodies. How do you... <laughs> You can't argue against that. <laughs> well, you took us to so-and-so's body. Yeah. We didn't even know that you killed them. And you reenacted how you did it for right. all these victims. And insanity goes out the legal definition, and it seems like Russia has the same thing we do. It goes out the window as soon as you try to cover up a crime. Oh, yeah, exactly. That you know the difference between right yep. and wrong at that point. You got it. Following the conclusion of the prosecutor's closing argument, the judge invited Chikatilo back into the courtroom before formally asking him whether he would like to make a final statement on his own behalf. In response, Chikatilo simply sat quiet. The judge then announced an initial date of September 15th for himself and two official jurors to review the evidence and pass the final sentence to Chikatilo. As court announced recess, the brother of a 17-year-old girl killed by Chikatilo in August of 1984 threw a heavy chunk of metal at him, hitting him in the chest. When security tried to arrest the young man, other victims' relatives shielded him and stopped the arrest. God I damn. I bet they did. So two jurors, huh? A judge and two official jurors. Yeah, that's what they have going on over there. That's like those three judge Troika things they had back in the 20s when they executed all the political prisoners and stuff. Well, it's also weird. Like, this judge clearly has his mind made up. What oh, the fuck are those yeah. two jurors even going to do? Yeah, he was done at like, the beginning. Well, judge, well, see, we think this. <laughs> so, no, I mean, what the fuck are they even doing there? Yep. On October 14th, the court reconvened to hear formal sentencing by announcing Chikatilo guilty of 52 of the 53 murders for which he had been tried. He was sentenced to death for each offense. No, come on. <laughs> it's really harsh in this circumstance. <laughs> he was sentenced to 52 deaths. <laughs> Chikatilo was also found guilty of five counts of sexual assault committed during the years he worked as a teacher in the 1970s. 
In reciting his findings, the judge read the list of murders again before criticizing both the police and the prosecutor's department for various mistakes in the investigation, which had allowed Chikatilo to remain free until 1990. Like when they let him go in 1984? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Yeah. That one? Yeah. Well, and then the second time when they found him in the train station and he had blood on his cheek. Yeah. That's and they it. let him go then yeah. as well. Yeah. You know, just after he had killed someone in the, <laughs> yeah, the woods. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> Chickatello was then taken from the courtroom to his cell to await execution. He did file an appeal against his conviction with the Russian Supreme Court, but this appeal was rejected in the summer of 1993. Following the rejection of his appeal to the Russian Supreme Court, Chickatello filed, filed a final appeal for clemency with President Boris Yeltsin. This final appeal was rejected on January 4th, 1994. Yeltsin was busy drinking. He had a time for that. <laughs> Boom. Vodka. Absolutely. <laughs> On February 14th, 1994, Chikatil was taken from his death row cell to a soundproof room and executed with a single gunshot behind the right ear and was buried in an unmarked grave at the prison cemetery. That's the Russian way. Single shot behind the ear. A soundproof room. That's just interesting. Mm -hmm. Just what? So let no other prisoners hear it? Privacy? Yeah. No. That's how they did it, though. Imagine being on that cleanup crew. I think they had a drain in the middle of the room. And that's it? You that's just it. Kind of mop it to the, to the mop drain? Mop it up. Oh, boy. Okay. This, uh, this guy was something else. Did he get what he deserved, Mike? I mean, it's I hard so. It's hard to argue that he didn't, but sure. still, a, still not for the death penalty. But, you know, you get a case like this, and how do you say someone like this doesn't deserve to die? I'm not going to... I'm not going to throw my life down and fight over that one. I don't disagree. I'm not going to shed tears over this guy. I just hope he repented to Jesus and he's uh, in heaven now. Well, <laughs> I think if, he died. if we <laughs> repent hard enough for him, I think that helps. Is that, does that help? It's in Leviticus. Well, it's in, in the, Leviticus. If he's in the bad place already. I don't think we can bring him back. I think you can. I don't know. Really? Maybe. Hmm. Psalms 14. <laughs> I'd, I'd like to direct your attention to that. Oh, I'll read that tomorrow. Thanks. Yep. <laughs> Austin 316 says, I just whooped your ass. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> That's the best one. <laughs> That's something I can get behind. So I don't know. Ian, what else you got? Anything else on Andre Chikatilo? Any <clears throat> final thoughts? No. I, I'm, I think I'm good on this one. This was a unplanned but long month of cannibalism going from jeffrey dahmer to the donner party and yeah now chikatilo well and chikatilo was like low-key like what he just ate a couple nipples and yeah. you know a tongue that come, on. Was. come on who hasn't done that <laughs> the heart wants i've dabbled, wants, I've dabbled in some nipple eating like that's come on <laughs> um yeah we really did talk about a lot of eating of human flesh a lot of it oh boy yeah. okay this was this was like low key a horrible story that like we covered. It's not that great. Is might be like top five worst people. Yeah, if anyone wants to check out the Citizen X HBO. That's right. You told us to watch from, that. Movie uh, from 1995. It's, it's kind of interesting. Three it's, out three out of five stars. Yeah, it's not great. Well, really bad Russian accents in my opinion. Well, but uh, yeah. are there are there good Russian accents in movies? It's hard to do. Um, that's okay. why I did not attempt it in any of these episodes. No. That's why we did Italian. We went Italian with it. <laughs> Chikatilo. We did Borat in Italian. It's <laughs> okay. a lot easier. <laughs> Kazakhstani in Italian. <laughs> when in doubt, just make up Although, your own accent. Kazakhstan was part of the USSR at this point in time. So, so we made I it work. we were fine. I think we were fine. Yeah. We were on the map. Sure. There. So yeah, check And had it not been for Ronald Reagan, Italy might have been a part of the USSR at some <clears> point. <throat> we scared them away, Dave. Yeah. We scared them away. Some truth behind that. <laughs> Um. All right. Well, Dave, you got any final thoughts no, on this guy? That's it. Check out the movie if you want a little. Uh, depiction. What's it called again? Citizen X. Available on HBO, 1995. You could probably steal it on like Daily yeah, Motion or you YouTube or something. Yeah, you know, one of those. It's interesting. All right. We got some new patrons. Want to give some shout outs to? Thank you very much to Zach, Whitney James, Isaiah Gray, Nikita Raleigh, Johnny Rainey, Chase Shreve. Jacob Muris, Abnerb, Stacy Becker, Jack Holloway, Grim Karen, Sal Torres, Pope Canabese, Kelly Vieng, Eblin Montgomery, Tony Vaughn, Chris, Michelle McKenzie, Bailey Goodwin, 
Nate, Rihanna Smith, Ryan Butcher, DFFL, Diffle, I guess, Manda Picord, and Jessica Thompson. Thank you very much. We are at patreon.com slash Necronomapod. Holy shit, that's a lot of new patrons. That's a good amount. Yeah, you're telling me, Pally. God damn. Their names God. get harder and harder every month. <laughs> you know what doesn't get harder every month? Andre Chikatilo. <laughs> <laughs> Not anymore. He's dead, Dave. It's too soon. Too soon. Way too soon for those kind of jokes. All right, uh, Ian, what do you got for us? For iTunes, I have one for Gray V, Savvy the Ginger. Savvy the Ginger left us a really, really nice review. I appreciate it. Um, Roxy Nut, Leon McLeod, Lift to Eat, Travis SS, and Perry Clan One. Thank you guys for the awesome reviews. All right. Dave, you got anything for us? No. No, I, no, I don't. He's good. He's good. He's ready to eat some chicken nuggets, I think. <laughs> I'm going to eat some pizza rolls. Uh, do you have some? I have a bag. Uh, yesterday, I went grocery shopping. You going to dip bought, those? Yeah, what are you going to dip them in? I'm, yeah, I'm going to try. I'm going to try hot sauce. All right. If you have and, ranch, yeah. too, try ranch just to do the both. You know, not I'll mix them, that. but I, I think you should double dip. Mix them's great. Ranch with hot sauce. You could also do that. All right. So review next week. I'm going to make a note. I want to hear Ian's uh, right. thoughts on the pizza rolls. Yep. All right. We are at Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, YouTube, at Necronomapod, patreon.com slash Necronomapod. We appreciate all the support you guys give us and listen every week. And uh, we'll see you next week. All right. You guys ready for a cool down beer? Let me open a beer. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs>